Well, good morning. Good to see everybody today. Did anybody get wet this morning? All right, there was some. Uh, when we left our house this morning, it, it was just cloudy. But right after we got in the building, about 10 minutes till 8, it started pouring. So some of you really got to enjoy that nice rain shower. But hey, I didn't have to water the grass today. God is good all the time. Well, we're glad that you're here, uh, and uh, I hope that you're ready to sing. Hope you're ready to spend a little time praising the Lord. And right now, while you're just sitting there, I'd like for you to stand with us. I'm forever grateful. Let's sing this song together. morning. I'm glad that you're here. As you go back to your seats, we're going to sing this great song, here we go. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, I give up. We are broke. You are my all in all. Jesus.
together this morning. We want to praise you. We want to thank you. And you've done so much for us. You are our all in all. We are forever grateful. May you just bless our time this morning as we celebrate, as we share together in the love that you have given us. Bless our time together, our singing, time around the table, time in your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated if you promise to sing on this great old hymn. There's power in the blood. Some of you are looking a little relaxed. We're going to sing seven powers in the chorus. You'll figure it out. It goes pretty easy. Stanza number two together. Would you be free from your passion and pride? Here we go. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood. Power in the blood. Take to God. last chorus or the fourth chorus third fourth verse when we get to the chorus there's love joy peace and everlasting life all right can you try it love joy peace everlasting life here we go would you do serve bless lord jesus your king there's power in the blood power in the blood would you with me please praise us to sing there's one people said I don't know because without the shedding of blood there is no remission or forgiveness of sins thank you Jesus amen for his gift to us we're going to dismiss all of the, the kids that want to go not you older folks but the we worship and junior worship right now we'll let the kids go and we're going to get ready to worship around the Lord's table today we're going to cheer for the Broncos today. I see a Bronco shirt. Who? <laughs> I like that. Whoever said that, that was good. You know, as we think about this next song, we get all excited about ball games, taking trips, doing things fun. There's no better celebration than what Jesus did for us at the cross. And we ought to celebrate that every day, especially every Lord's Day. And we're going to sing this great song through. I'm going to let you stay seated. But let's stand up in our hearts as we sing. On bended knee.
Good morning, everyone. There's a 10% chance of rain in, in our area today, so just plan, plan the balance of your day with that. Uh, I wanted to uh, visit a few moments with you about eternity. Uh, it's a subject that comes up uh, from time to time among groups of people that I get to hang out with. And I wanted to mention uh, a couple of names to the, to the church here. One is Tim Peterson. Some of you may remember Tim Peterson, traveled through our area as a gospel singer, and uh, he's a brother of Joe. And uh, another a name to share with you is Dan Johnson. Uh, Dan and Loretta Johnson uh, were in our area for many, many years. Uh, Dan had a popular radio program called Him Time Country Style. Um, started out KNEB, actually started out on Terrytown Station, then he moved to KNEB, then he came over to KCMI, and uh, we enjoyed having Dan. Uh, Tim traveled uh, America doing gospel programs uh, at nursing homes and churches and, and, and any, pretty much any place that would, that would uh, have him over there. And then uh, Dan and Loretta uh, were in our area for a long time, uh, including uh, his radio program. Dan was one of the uh, founding members of the Frontier School of the Bible and uh, just enjoyed those two people and to visit with them from time to time when you got some one-on-one -on -one with them. And eternity would come up frequently with Tim's programs. And uh, Tim at WellCare, I mean, and, and other places uh, around the area where we got to hear him sing, uh, now it's called Heritage, a different name back in those days. Uh, he could get the crowd worked up pretty quick uh, with the older people, which now I get to, I, I'm in that group now. Uh, but anyway, he would say, you know, uh, after this life and we, and we go to heaven and we're in eternity, there are no more crutches, the crowd would roar, there's no more prescriptions, no more doctor's appointments, no more physical therapy, no more ambulance rides to the ER, no more hearing aids, no more glasses, compression socks, wheelchairs and cannulas with oxygen, things of that nature, and the crowd would you know, he'd get them riled up pretty good. But he would talk about eternity uh, that way. Dan uh, had an expression that he, he would use because Dan was, when the Frontier School of the Bible got up and running, then he became a circuit preacher and he preached frequently up at Hawk Springs and we got to go up there a couple times for them. And uh, one of the uh, exhibits that Dan would give for us, because as we live on the planet as we live now, we are three dimensional. We have X, Y, and Z. We have this way and that way and they intersect and then sometimes you get to get to that third level so you get to have elevation in addition to having north and south. So his story would be once a year an eagle would swoop down on planet earth and swipe its beak just one time on the surface of the planet, once a year. Then when the entire planet was about the size of a pea, we would have then experienced one second of eternity. So then that gives us kind of a visual thing on on uh, how long it is. Dan Johnson had a great example. Tim Peterson w was very correct, and I, I agree with those things, and I kind of go with all of the above about eternity. Plus, I want to add to those two examples of eternity. In eternity, there is no distance, and there is no time. We have so many mansions to go visit. If you start thinking about people who have gone ahead of us, well, we won't, we won't, we, we got to, we got to schedule two weeks because our, we, you know, our weekends are going to be busy because we're still stuck in that dimension of time and so many people to see and for those visits to take place. So we got a lot of things to do. So as, uh, as I was writing this, uh, the material the other day, it took me back to a time uh, in my life where the group was on the road and JM Wyoming was just a, a neat place to go. And, uh, uh, a, lot of, a lot of our music was done a cappella because JM couldn't afford a piano uh, at their church. So uh, the lines from some of the songs that we would do there over the Sunset Mountains, uh, at the last trump, we shall all be changed. We will understand it better by and by. And what a glorious day that will be. And this time during our services, we have communion we are still for just a little bit of time. We block out the rest of the world and we concentrate on the items and the dimensions of our lives that these emblems help us to reflect on what Christ uh, did for us a couple thousand years ago 
and uh, to where we are today and how we get to join him in what we are referring to as eternity and forever, which in our minds we're thinking is a long time, but there really is no time there as I see it, and there's no distance. But it is large, and, and there's no stopwatch, so we have things like that to look forward to. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for this time that we can set aside during our services, during a, a busy uh, life that we have with, with work and family and kids and, and uh, grandkids, great-grandkids, friends uh, in the church, outside the church, and all of the things that we get to do as we share time with our friends on this earth. Just be with us as we are still, as we reflect and uh, you are reminding us of what is yet to come. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. As we come at this time for the offering, if you'd pray with me, our gracious Father, you are the King of kings, Lord of lords. You are the I am of I am. You're the beginning and the end. Journey, Father, as we bring our tithes into your storehouse and our offerings, I'd ask that you'd bless the tithes and the offering and bless the individuals who have 
brought their tithes and offerings into your storehouse. Bless them and bless this church body. Dear Heavenly Father, be with Lyle as he brings the message to us. Bless our ears and our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with us? You know, if you're giving your money, we need to give thanks. It's a great little chorus. Thanks with a great little heart. Here we go. Everybody say Shavuot to Kristen. (laughs) Shavuot. That's pretty funny. (laughs) I think I'm on now. You know the sermon's going to be long and boring when the preacher's yawning before he gets up here. (laughs) How many Eutychuses do we have in the room? Who in the world is Eutychus? I'm going to share a passage of scripture out of Acts chapter 20. I'm going to tell you about Eutychus. He had a case of the yawns on one Lord's Day morning. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. He preached till midnight. Probably didn't start at 10.35 in the morning, but probably started about 6 o'clock in the evening. There were many lamps in the upstairs room where we were gathered together, and there was a young man named Eutychus sitting on the windowsill, sinking into a deep sleep, and as Paul kept on talking, Eutychus was overcome by sleep and fell down from the third floor and was picked up dead. But Paul went down and fell upon him, and after embracing him, he said, Do not be troubled, for he is still alive. When Paul had gone back up and had broken the bread and eaten, he talked with them a long while until daybreak and then left. They took away the boy alive and were greatly comforted. Sleepers in church, huh? Any Eutychuses? Yeah? At least you're honest, Ashton. 
Aren't you thankful we don't have a third-story building with a windowsill that you could sit in? Heard about a minister who he decided he was going to do something about a man that often slept during his sermons. And while the man was sleeping, the minister said, All who want to go to heaven, please rise. Everyone stood up except the sleeper. And then he walked over to where the man was sleeping, and he screamed out right next to him, All who wish to go to hell, stand up now. Only the sleeper stood up. The sleeper looked around, and he saw he, and he was the only one standing. He said, I don't know what we're voting on, preacher, but it looks like you and me are the only ones for it. (laughs) Sleepers in church. There's an old saying, an army marches on its stomach. An army marches on its stomach. What that means is, if an army doesn't feed its men, it's not going anywhere. Without food, the troops eventually can't march, they can't maneuver, and they can't fight. So one of the logistical problems for armies has always been, where do you get the food to feed your men and women? Well, back in World War II, one of the ways the U.S. tried solving this issue was called K-rations. Anybody ever had a K-ration? They were about 900 calorie meals packed into handy little boxes. And they looked yummy. There was the breakfast unit where you might get chopped ham and eggs or veal loaf, biscuits, a dried fruit bar or cereal bar, water purification tablets, cigarettes, chewing gum, instant coffee, and sugar. Then there was the dinner unit, which could have processed ham and cheese, biscuits, malted milk tablets, or five caramels, sugar, a salt packet, cigarettes, chewing gum, and a powdered beverage. And the supper unit often would have canned meat, such as Spam, with a carrot and apple, Did, did, we, did you find on those pictures that the carrot and the apple were ground up into the, yeah, the, yeah interesting stuff there. Um, biscuits, a two-ounce chocolate bar, a packet of toilet paper tissues, cigarettes, chewing gum, and a bouillon soup cube. I went to Bible college with a student who had uh, somehow acquired some kind of K rations. I don't remember the details. I don't remember how old they were. I just remember him eating the canned meat part of those K rations, and he brought them to college because he was low on funds. Now, again, I don't know how old they were, but, but he said they didn't taste too bad. Well, I guess if you're hungry, uh, Spam and veal loaf uh, would be pretty good, huh? How many of you eat spam? I, I, don't, I don't actually mind spam. Hawaiians eat spam. Hawaiians have several ways to cook spam. When the, the coers were here, she, she brought one time a spam like sushi roll thing with, with what do you call that stuff? You let it, uh, that, what do you wrap that stuff with? What was it called? Seaweed wrap, yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't. Spam and seaweed wrap. How does that sound? An army marches on its stomach. Food is an indispensable need for soldiers in combat. And as you might imagine, God knows that. One of the images of, that, that the Bible uses of Christians is that we are soldiers. Paul referred to a man, Archippus, as a fellow soldier uh, in Philemon, 
verses 1 and 3, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker, and to Aphia, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier. Paul also referred to another man named Epaphroditus in Philippians 2.25 as my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier. Paul writes to Tech and Timothy, and he says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful people who will be able to teach others also. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. So we're soldiers of Christ. A spiritual army deployed by God to contend with evil. Uh, in Ephesians 6.11, we're told to put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. So we're soldiers. And we are at war, and we need to eat. What are we going to eat? Well, Jesus has supplied a very special meal for us. We just spent some time around the table. It's called communion. It's called the Lord's Supper. And the early church took seriously um, this, this uh, amazing meal. Acts 2.42 tells us of the early Christians, the early church, that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And in our text this morning, it says in Acts 20, verse 7, on the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. And every scholar I read, the, every commentator I read, basically says the same thing. When the early church spoke about breaking bread, it was their way of saying they had communion. And they did it every Sunday when they assembled together. In fact, a Christian leader from around 150 A.D. named Justin Martyr wrote, On Sunday, a meeting is held of all who live in the cities and villages, and at the close of the meeting, they focused on the bread and wine and thanks for them according to his ability, and the congregation answers amen. Then the consecrated elements are distributed to each one and partaken of and are carried by the deacons to the houses of the absent. And so it appears that on Sunday, the first day of the week, the church took communion. In fact, here in Acts 20, we're told that the reason they were at church was to break bread. Notice how the text describes their purpose for gathering. It, it does not say they gathered to sing songs, although I, I imagine they did sing some songs. It does not say they gathered to hear the preaching of the word. But in this context, they did hear a very long sermon. And again, some of you think that I preach long sermons, but long is kind of a relative term. Matter of fact, did you hear about the man who stood up during a long sermon and he walked out? And then he returned about 30 minutes later? The preacher asked him after the service where he went. He said, I went to get a haircut. The preacher said, why didn't you get a haircut before church? The man said, I didn't need one then. <laughs> That's a long sermon. I mean, Paul was there. He was a very famous evangelist, and I'm sure everybody wanted to hear him, but, but Paul was not the reason they had gathered. Again, the text does not say they gathered for prayer, but I'm sure they prayed. But the text does say they gathered to break bread. They gathered together to take the Lord's Supper. Paul was uh, an after-dinner treat. But the main event was communion. But why was this meal so important? Why would they make it the main focus for assembling? Well, I can think of two reasons. First, when you take communion, you're, you're sitting down with Jesus. Every time you take communion, Jesus is there. This is his table. Jesus had earlier promised where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. So he is there, he is here every time 
you take communion. Secondly, the communion table is where you are reminded of our mission. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul tells us, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You see, when we take the Lord's Supper, we remember why we're here in the first place. Because the bottom line is that on any given Sunday morning, the songs and or instruments may not suit you. You might prefer traditional music. You might prefer songbooks. You might prefer organ music or piano music or no instrument. You might prefer contemporary music. You might prefer lots of instruments, a worship team and the volume to be turned up a bit. You might prefer to sing new songs or you might prefer to have everything just really familiar every Sunday. On any given Sunday, the person up here leading us in singing or praying or meditations may be long and they, might, they may be hard to follow. On any given Sunday, the, the, the person up here might not have the exact personality that suits you. On any given Sunday, the sermon might be boring and put you to sleep so that if you were in a window on the third story, you might fall out and die. On any given Sunday, the sermon might be boring or long. On any given Sunday, the humor might not be as humorous as the preacher thinks it is. <laughs> Who among us have not at some time felt like he would die if the preacher didn't shut up pretty soon? That was not a time for Ashton to raise your hand. <laughs> Who hasn't been hurt by a sermon? Or at least bored beyond words? However, on any given Sunday, the bread and the cup will always declare the same message. Jesus died for you. He died for me. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 1.15, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom Paul says, I am the worst. Communion reminds us that we are sinners and that we're not here in the place, in this place, to be entertained. We're not here to be catered to. We're here because Jesus died to forgive our sins and to change our lives. And because of that, our mission is to tell everyone we meet what Jesus means to us. Communion is the one part of our assembly that we can always depend upon to remind us why we're here and, and what we've been commissioned to do. In fact, you know why the early Christians took communion on Sunday rather than worshiping on Saturday like the Jews did? What special thing had Jesus done on the first day of the week? He rose from the dead. In the Old Testament, God commanded Israel to celebrate on Saturday because he wanted them to remember his power in creation. God worked for six days and rested on the seventh. But Christians in the New Testament celebrated on Sunday, the first day of the week, because God wanted his people to remember his power in the resurrection. And communion reinforces and reminds Christians of that power of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection.
Why did the early church take communion so often? I mean, they did it every week. Could they have gotten by with once a month? Or once a quarter? Or once a year? I think you could. But, but bear in mind, this was the most important part of their assembly. This is why they had gathered. And I wonder if almost if they would starve themselves spiritually if they missed a Sunday at the table. One of the things that the creators of the early K rations didn't realize was that their 900 calorie meals weren't nearly enough to sustain fighting men in the midst of a battle zone. It wasn't bad for a stroll in the park or doing drills in camp, but for serious marching and fighting, it wasn't nearly enough. Soldiers in battle were literally burning off more calories than they consumed. That was going to hurt them over the long haul. And that's why more of a modern army has upped the calories in their MRE, meals ready to eat, to 1,200 instead of 900 per package. The early church apparently felt that taking communion just once in a while wasn't going to supply them with enough spiritual calories to help them in daily conflicts. In a world filled with evil, as soldiers of Christ, they needed this meal every week. Occasionally someone will ask me, should I let my kids and grandkids take communion? It seems like a reasonable question. It is a reasonable question. I mean, the plates pass right by them with those tempting little wafers, tempting little piece of bread, and those cups filled with that tasty grape juice. It's only natural that they'd want to take a little for themselves. But then there are others who become offended when they see little children eat what essentially is a special meal designed by God for believers. At one point, the church worked very hard to make sure that no one took communion that shouldn't. They called it closed communion. And every denomination handled the problem differently. I don't like it that uh, the one that taught restoration history here is actually in church today here, Andy Grant. I took her class. I took, I took it originally from Dr. Perriott, and then I took it again from Andy Grant, restoration history. So if I don't have my dates right, I'm sure I'll hear about it. Back in 1807, an Irish Presbyterian minister named Thomas Campbell came to America. For some time after he arrived, his denomination, the anti-Burger Seceder Presbyterians, had a process to make sure that no one outside their group would take communion. Like many Protestant groups, they observed the Lord's Supper periodically, once a quarter or, or whatever. And they would, ask, they would ask members to come in the night before on Saturday and answer a series of questions. And if they got all the questions right, they would get a coin. And then on Sunday morning, they would drop the coin in a box and obtain communion. Well, when Campbell got to America, he angered the denominational leaders because he served the Lord's Supper to Presbyterians who were not part of his group. I think he was actually tried for heresy. And so in 1809, he left the seceder Presbyterians and he helped form a unity society called the Christian Association, which is my understanding became the basis for our brotherhood known as the Christian Churches and Churches of Christ. And from that day until this day, the Lord's table in our congregation has been open to anyone who wants to partake. We don't stand guard along the aisles to make sure that you have all the credentials or you have a coin, that only faithful members take the cup and bread. In fact, we'll sometimes clearly say this is the Lord's table, not ours. You must decide between you and God if you should take part of it. 
So can you give communion to little children? Well, yes, you, you can. We're, we're not going to stop you. I think probably a better teaching is what we taught our kids, that their first communion would come right after they became Christians. The communion meal is for soldiers in the army of Christ. It's for the saved. It's for those who've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And for the most part, little children don't really understand its importance, and it doesn't mean anything to them. And so it would probably be better to wait until they've made the decision to belong to Christ. Now there's one more thing that catches my attention as we think about that verse, Acts 20 and verse 7, came together to break bread. There's a common misconception that people don't need church to worship God. They view Christianity as something they can do all by themselves. A kind of lone ranger religion that they can practice in the corner somewhere. I don't believe that to be true. And one of the things that exposes that untruth, that lie, is, a com- is communion. Because the word itself, communion, comes from the Greek word koinonia, And it means uh, having in common. A koinos. Partnership. Fellowship. Communion is meant to be, share- to be a shared experience. It's the time when God's army gets together to prepare for battle. We gain strength from our numbers. We gain power from our unity. I read that the army used to have the motto, an army of one. I don't really understand what that actually means because, quite frankly, I'm pretty sure that very few soldiers like to be out on the battlefront all alone. It's not only lonely, it's dangerous. Communion declares we need each other. The Lord's table is designed to be a time when we come together to share koinonia. Now, of course, just because all the troops gather under one roof to eat together doesn't mean we don't tend to fight among ourselves rather than fight with the enemy. I mean, how many of us can can tell a, a horror story of churches where Christians beat up on each other I've seen churches where believers hate one another, but they'll piously take the bread and the cup as if God is honored by that. I remember hearing about one congregation where the hatred had run so deep that the people literally sat on opposite sides of the church building and would have nothing to do with one another. But they all ate communion at the appropriate time. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. He knows our hearts. Jesus once said, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to your brother. Then, come and offer your gift. Essentially, Jesus was saying, if, if you got a conflict going on between you and a brother, don't, don't bother bringing your gift to God until you at least try to get it settled. He doesn't want the gift offered in that fashion, and he won't accept it. In the church at Corinth, people tried eating communion while mistreating other Christians. And Paul told them, that's why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. They died. God made them sick and even caused them to die because they took, because they took communion while hating their brothers and sisters in Christ. God takes this seriously. God hates it when his people hurt each other. Communion should be a time when you close ranks. A time when we 
should watch our brothers and our sisters back. God demands that we fight the enemy, not each other. Therefore, Paul tells us that a man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. So if you've had a problem of hatred toward a brother or sister or have cheated them, don't you dare take communion until you've made it right. All you'll end up doing is eating and drinking judgment upon yourself. My understanding is that during World War II, some parts of the soldiers' K rations were so valuable that the troops would sometimes use them as currency. They'd barter these items for other commodities that they needed. Their K rations were a precious commodity. And I think what we need to remember here is that the Lord's table is a precious commodity to Jesus. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread, broke it, and said, this is my body broken for you. And then he took the cup and explained, this is my blood shed for you. In communion, the risen Lord himself is present and working in the Thanksgiving meal of the church to create a new world in the midst of the old world. Just like in Luke 24 on the road to Emmaus, Jesus is present with us as we break the bread. As we break bread, we see Jesus and we fellowship with him. The resurrection of Eutychus was just a symbol of what Christ does in the Lord's Supper. It is a meal that heals a sick world. The power of life is in Jesus and the supper we encounter And in the supper, we encounter Jesus. Like Eutychus, we die with Christ to this world and are raised with Christ to the new world. Our gatherings are symbolic of the new creation coming to life in the midst of the old decaying world. And as we eat the bread, we not only remember his body, but we become his body in the world. As we drink the cup, which represents his lifeblood, we not only remember his life, we are filled with his life so that we may go out in the world to continue his life. So I would say never take this table for granted. Hold the bread and the cup as more valuable than gold because they represent the price Jesus paid for your salvation and mine. Take it weekly, take it gratefully, and take it as a time of sharing with your brothers and sisters in Christ. God, we thank you for this day. I thank you for this opportunity to to be in this place. We gathered to partake of the Lord's Supper And while we were here, we participated in singing some great songs and and praying for one another, fellowshipping with one another, hearing a message from your word. And so it's good that we can uh, assemble. It's good that we can come and remember And so, God, I pray that as you uh, look into our hearts that you'd find us faithful. God, I pray that we would be a a people of men and women and kids that will go from this place looking a little more like your son, Jesus. Help us to be Jesus to this world. Thank you for the strength that you've given us. May our week coming up be blessed And may we be a blessing to to many. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand with us this morning? This is a little longer song, but when the guy wrote this song 20-some years ago by the name of Matt Redman, music was a big deal. Southern gospel was becoming a big deal. And...
minister of that church said, we got to get back to the heart of worship. That helped him put this song together. Let's remember it as we think about it. God's people said, amen. amen. You smell the food coming from the kitchen. There is fellowship dinner just immediately following our time here. You're welcome to stay for lunch. Even if you're not prepared to have brought something, you're still welcome to stay. Uh, so that'll happen just shortly. Uh, I will invite you to Wednesday nights. Uh, at, we're, we started up last week again. Meal at 6, nice meal at 6, and... Uh, Classes for all ages at 7. Uh, if you didn't make it last week, it's not too late. You come in anytime you, you'd love to, or anytime you want to. We'd just love to have you. Uh, you. You won't be behind or anything like that in the classes. Just, just come and enjoy uh, Wednesday Night Fellowship. Also, I just want to recognize Ted and Andy Grant. Uh, They're in the back there, and they, three months ago, moved to uh, Wisconsin. I can't remember the name of the town, but it's somewhere in Wisconsin. Um, they don't even know, probably. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, 
They are doing a, a new ministry, uh, a ministry they've dreamed about for quite a while. It's called Ten Minas Ministry, and uh, they're reaching out to ministers um, far and wide uh, that are struggling, uh, trying to keep ministers from burning out, uh, trying to uh, encourage them and counsel them and work to keep uh, we're, we're already experiencing a great shortage of ministers across the land, and so they're trying to at least encourage the ones that we do have uh, to, to stay with the battle and stay, stay in it. And so uh, I'm going to give them a time to come out here and share their new work um, with us uh, in the future. They just kind of snuck up on me this time. I didn't have a real good time to, to, to offer them to, to share their new work. But next time, next time you're here, we'll, we'll have you come and share uh, your new adventure. So thank you for doing what you're doing. And I get to have somebody eat with me at El Mocajete in the morning, Mr. Ted Grant. <laughs> God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Let's sing this chorus together. I'm forever grateful. I'm forever grateful. a great day.